Welcome to Home Practice. This is a groundwork session on an introduction to translation. I'm Laura and a brief audio description for anyone that it's useful for. I'm a white female in my 30s. I've got brunette hair tied back in a turquoise dance top and I'm sitting in my wheelchair. So this groundwork session is an introduction into translation and we're going to focus on translation in particular with its relevance to technique class. And this is going to be the first in what will become a series of videos or sessions on translation. As this is an introduction, it's going to be a bit more of a conversational style session. So there'll be time to talk and reflect and also time to practice and explore different translation options. Therefore, as it's going to be a little bit stop and start with movement, do take responsibility for yourself. Make sure you're warmed up and ready to do any of the moves that you try um, and keep warm in between when we're talking. If you want, do feel free to start warming up now as we're discussing things. So let's start at the very beginning. What do I mean by translation? Well, put simply, it's the act of taking movement from one person one body type and translating it and making it relevant and work for another person or dancer with a potentially different body type or learning style. This is particularly useful when working with a diverse mix of dancers and also from translating from non-disabled or disabled onto non-disabled or vice versa. And so as we go through, I'm going to give various different examples, but you'll also see some examples of potential movement ideas from some of the other stopgap dancers. Now you might already be doing something a little bit like this, but maybe calling it a different name. The reason why we call it translation is because the equality that it gives. So we think of it as each dancer has their own unique dance language that's personal to them. But that dance language can be then translated onto a different dancer and it still has meaning and makes sense for another dancer. And also translation is something that happens two ways. You can translate back and forth from different languages. Why we use translation is because being able to translate really helps you to be able to personalize movement and make it relevant for you and to be able to make things like a technique class more accessible. It can also be used as a choreographic device to make more interesting or cohesive movement, but that's for another session. So today we're just going to focus on technique and think about finding that personalized movement rather than just doing your best impression of a movement. How we go about this? Well, often when you first start translating, there's an instinct to just look at the movement and try and cre recreate it as a whole shape, which can work, but that can also be sometimes quite overwhelming. Um, particularly when there's a complex movement or shape. So what we're going to do in this session is look at how we can break down movement to make it more manageable to translate. Now, the way that I like to break down and translate movement comes from my experience as a wheelchair dancer accessing mainstream dance class. I found that translation is an essential tool for dancers with what is perceived to be a non-typical dance body. But I believe it's a useful skill for everyone, whether that's simply because you're dancing from home, maybe you're in a small space or you're dancing on carpet, maybe you might have an injury, 
or you just have a different physicality and different movement available to you than the person who's teaching you. But being able to break down this movement can help you have a clear way to process. So during this session, we're going to look at eight different aspects of breaking movement down. And I've grouped these together in four sets of two. But don't worry, you don't have to do all eight on one movement. There's rarely time in class to do that. It's really to give you the tools that you can pick and choose what works for what movement. But the first two that we're going to start with are intention and energy. So we're going to start with intention. Basically, what's the purpose of the movement? Or what's the intended outcome? This could be, for example, something like building up strength or stamina, practicing coordination, practicing and developing balance, or maybe it could be preparation for another movement. We're going to start with a very simple movement to start with and work through what the potential intentions are. So if I start, I'm going to pop my brakes on and I'm going to simply push up on my wheels like this. So I've pushed up. So have a think, what does that look like for you? What's your initial instinct to translate? Now, I imagine if you're a standing dancer, you've most likely pushed up into a rise on your toes. And that's fine. That is a relevant translation. It could be it's about changing height. So I've, by pushing up, I've gone higher. However, there are some other things happening. It's also a bit of a two-way stretch or an action and reaction. By pressing down, I go up. So rather than just rising, you might find that two-way um, movement. So think about pressing down somehow, whether that's with your hands or finding some kind of press to rise. This might also be if you're a seated dancer and it's available to you, you might press through your legs to find a lengthen. Or you might think about grounding in your base and finding a high release. So that's about two-way stretch. Also, another thing that's happening is as I push up, it allows my spine to lengthen and I can find more length. So what would that look like for you? This could be in a different direction maybe. For a standing dancer, it could be finding some form of downward dog or stretch where you're pushing weight through your hands to find lengthening in your spine. It might be about leaning forwards and finding some length in your spine on a diagonal. We then also have, if I were to do it again, but repeat it lots of times, then it is something completely different. There I can tell you it's a strengthening exercise. So what might that one look like for you? It could well be that you choose to stick with the same body part and do some strengthening with your arms, potentially some form of push up or press up, whether that's on the floor or leaning into another surface like a wall. You could also translate it onto a different body part. So rather than pressing with your arms, if it's available to you, you might do some form of squats or something to work and strengthen in your legs. Because after all, I use my arms to move me around and shift me through the space. And most, well, if you're a standing dancer, you're most likely to be using your legs to shift you through the space. Finally, it could also be a preparation move. So for example, I might push up in order to give myself space to then lower or find a fold. So can you find some kind of preparation move creating a base so you have somewhere to then fold. This also could be like this, uh, pressing on the front of my chair in order to be able to fold. It might be that you find a different base or um, somewhere else on your chair or on the floor. So that's five different potential intentions from just one very simple move. So you can see how knowing the intention can make quite a difference 
with what translation you might use and how you can find the most relevant translation for that situation. Linked to intention is energy. Now by energy, I don't necessarily mean the speed, how fast or slow it is, but it could also be the effort that you put into moving or how challenging or difficult that movement is for you. So for example, we're gonna take another simple move and work through it. So this time, I'm gonna take my brakes off and find a simple balance. What is a simple balance for you? For me, a wheelie is quite a simple balance. That's quite easy for me. It might be something else. It could be for you standing on one leg, taking another rise, or finding some kind of less stable position. It could be potentially shifting forwards in your wheelchair, so you're then not resting against your back. It could also be if you're using crutches, lifting them up, or letting go of a mobility aid. So that's starting, but we're starting with one that's fairly simple and easy for you. Then let's look at how we can make it more complex. What ways, what do you think you could do to make the, your balance, your easy balance, a bit more challenging? One of the ways for me is if I'm doing a wheelie, is either to change my focus or to close my eyes completely. Definitely adds a little bit more challenge. You can give that a try, see how that changes your balance. It could also be that when you're in your balance, you remove a limb, move a limb into a different position or change your body shape, find some kind of lean. Finding an extra challenge there. Or it could be about making your base smaller. Can you find a smaller base? For me in my wheelie, that could either be taking one hand off or it could be trying to hold my wheels with a smaller amount. So I'm now just gripping with my thumb and my index finger. So there's all sorts of ways again that you can change the challenge or the energy involved. So it's quite important when you're in technique class to try and make sure that you're matching your, your energy and your challenge level with what is in the exercise or what is being asked. Again, we've seen there's lots of different variations and with all these variations, unfortunately, it means that we can't just make a dictionary or a glossary that says, when dancer A does this, dancer B does this because there's just too many possibilities. But in a way, that's a good thing because it means that it gives you the opportunity to really personalize the movement and make it work for you. Now we're going to move on to the next pair, spine and direction. So when you're looking at translating, often it's easy to get um, distracted and think about the limbs and the extremities, but actually the spine can play quite an important part in what the movement is. There's obviously lots of different ways the spine can move, so let's have a play. You can tilt and tip in different directions. See what directions you can tip in. You've also got twists, different kinds of twists, different curves, and also ripples. So all that movement, and that can be quite important as the base from where a movement comes from. So we're gonna look at my wheelie again but this time, rather than assuming that it's a balance, we're gonna look at it and look at what my spine is doing and see how that translates for a movement for you. So I'm gonna turn sideways. And then as I go into a wheelie, have a look what my spine is doing. So you'll notice that actually my hips are curving under and my shoulders are coming towards my knees. And the bigger the wheelie I go into, the bigger the curve. So 
can you find what that would might mean for you? Potentially, again, it could be for a standing dancer, rocking back on your heels, so you're finding a, a sense of going backwards and a curve in your spine that way. It could be that you pick your knees up and bring them towards your chest to help tuck your pelvis under. It could be if you're a seated dancer that you find some kind of curve. So sideways again, if I hold onto the front of my chair and push back, I'm again finding this curve rounding in my shoulders. It might also be that actually it's a move that's lower down, maybe on the floor, and you find a way to curve, bring your legs up and curve your shoulders in on the floor. Now, obviously, with a move like that, the movements that become, that happen before or after is going to have an influence on whether you would choose a lower level version or an upright version. We then have direction. And this could be either you're facing in the space, which direction you're facing, or it could be which direction you're traveling. So if we look at a sideways movement, which is the bane of my life when it comes to being in a wheelchair, because no one's invented a wheelchair that moves sideways yet. So if it was just a simple sidestep that I was translating, I might find I can do a little shift and wiggle to move sideways which looks a bit like this, going one way, back to the front, or I could reverse it going forwards into the direction of travel and then back to the front. Now, however, if you're, that's for moving sideways. However, if you're translating this move, you might notice the direction in my facing. I've not just moved sideways. I've opened to face back the way I'm about to travel and then opened again to face the front or close to travel towards and face the front. So it might be that your translation includes that twist with the facing and finding a way to rearrange your feet so they follow to travel sideways rather than just taking a step. Now, if we're traveling a greater distance, then doing a little sideways wiggle might not be the, uh, the best answer. So it might be to do with shifting in the space. Obviously, uh, here we're limited and you might well be limited at home as to how much space you have to travel. So then it could be about uh, facing and traveling in that direction, but just finding, again, the energy for that direction. It could be that you face your wheels in one direction, but open and twist in the spine to give your focus in a different direction. These things, particularly spine and direction, can be really useful in a class setting when you're translating a turn, as finding different variations and differentiations in a turn can sometimes be difficult. So I'm just gonna show a simple turn. I'm going to start facing the side and then I'm going to lean towards the front, finding a curve in my spine. And I'm going to try and keep that while I turn halfway. Like so. And I can turn back again, keeping my head turning back. So there might be various different variations of that. Again, might include different levels, might include adding support to the floor so you can really find a big lean rolling round to the other side. Give it a try. Next, we're gonna look at quality or texture and rhythm. This might also be when you think about your use of breath and momentum or the weight within a movement. Looking at quality, this is often something that would be, uh, that you would look at when doing, for example, a swings exercise or some kind of swing and momentum within class. 
It's also quite useful if you're having to transfer movement from one body part onto a different body part, as sometimes that body part might not move in exactly the same way, but you can still find the same quality or texture. And there is a home practice seed video on textures if you want to look more into that. But for now, we're going to look at some swings. So start to find a swing for yourself and have a think what is most important about it? What is the quality? How does it feel? So wherever that swing is in your body, for me, I find it most easiest to swing my arms forwards and back. And you can feel, hopefully you can feel there should be some weight and then some suspension within this swing. You might maybe try it on a different body part, explore where it seems to work, where maybe it doesn't work so well. Does it work in your shoulders, in your head? When you've had a bit of a explore of those swings, we can then look at maybe a challenge that might come with swings. If there's within an exercise, there's a swing which is long arms swinging side to side in front of my body, what challenge might there be? Well, certainly for me, the immediate challenge is I'm going to hit my legs. So then obviously I could then shorten my arms, but I might not get the same quality. Might also be a challenge if you're using another mobility aid and therefore you're using your arms to support you. So we could then look at keeping that same quality and texture of the swing, but moving it somewhere else. So for example, it could be having it in my shoulders. I might maybe change the direction so it's more on a diagonal or forwards and back. It might also be that I transfer that swing into a different body part. So I could think of my knees going side to side and that becomes a bit of a twist in the chair. But it still has that momentum and that quality of the swing. We then can also look at rhythm, which is sometimes related to quality and texture. You might, within a class setting, you might experience rhythm in particular when you have a detailed exercise that focuses on counts. This could be something, some kind of articulation exercise. So to explore this, I'm going to give us a rhythm that we're gonna to learn together, and then we're gonna try putting it onto different body parts and see how well that works. So the rhythm is, it's and one and two, then nothing for count three, four and five, a long count through six, seven, and then eight. So that is slowly again. And one and two, nothing for three, four and five, long count, six, seven, eight. Try it a little bit faster. And one and two, wait three, four and five, six, seven, eight bit faster. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. So I'm going to show you what I might do for that rhythm. And you can be thinking about either trying to find something similar with your body or transferring it onto a different body part. Now each count doesn't necessarily have to be percussive. It doesn't have to make a sound as long as there is a move for each count. So my version is going to be, I'm going to grab my wheel one side and tap, grab the other side and tap, and that's and one and two. So it's grab, tap, grab, tap, wait for three. Then I'm going to grab the front of my chair for four and then and five, I'm going to bend my elbows and five. Six, seven, the long count is going to be a float before I come back to my lap. So that is again from the top. Grab, tap, grab, tap, wait, grab, bend, bend, float, down. Again, 
and one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. One more time. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. So you can have a pause and a practice here. Maybe, as I said, you might find something similar or you might try it on a different body part. When you're ready, we'll have another go together. So we're going to go. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. And one and two, three, four and five, six, seven, eight. How did you do? Hopefully you got it and found a movement for each count. If you want, you can also have another pause and maybe try it with some different body parts or some different moves. Sometimes um, when we're thinking about rhythm within a class setting, one of the challenges can be that the rhythm is, comes from a body part that maybe you don't have available to you or you don't have access to move. So this might be for an example, if there was a rhythm that the first count came from bend in the knees and then a bend in the elbows. So obviously for me, I can't bend my knees, but I might think about to keep that same rhythm, I might think about maybe doing a double bend in the elbows, so bend, bend, or I might think about maybe bending one and then the other, so I've still got two bends, or I might think about finding it somewhere else on my body, so it might be that it's a head and then bend. It depends on the setting of the exercise and maybe also a bit on the speed of the exercise. Um, but yes, so that is rhythm and quality. So finally, we have detail and focus. Now these may sound like uh, something that's small, but it actually does make quite a difference or it can make quite a difference to your movement. But it may be that you, first of all, get the movement and get it in your bodies before you then add this final layer of detail and focus. We're gonna look at them together with a simple change of direction. So if I were to face side onto the camera and then turn towards the camera, you might see that if you're just looking at direction as a quarter turn. I'll do it one more time. but have a think about what detail and focus did you notice? Quite often it's at the start or at the end of a movement. Do it one more time. I'll try and doing it the same. So at the start of the movement, we had a little detail of preparation. I reached down to my wheel and I, as I did, my fingers had a little bit of a ripple. So how might that translate to you, that bit of detail? As you maybe press into a surface, can you find some form of ripple or articulation? So we have the articulation. Then to turn to face the front, it's actually the movement is initiated from my shoulder. It's my shoulder that pulls up and then lift and pull. So can you think about where you initiate your movement from? Can you find a pull to initiate your turn? Do that again. We have the prepare fingers, pull to turn. And I didn't do it that time, but this time look at where my focus is. So it's the last thing to come to the front. So there's a bit of a sequential movement happen happening there. Have a thing, have a try with that. You might maybe explore it on a different level, um, but think particularly about the detail and the focus. I'll do it one more time for you. So those are all the sections we've had intention and energy, spine and direction, quality or texture and rhythm, and finally detail and focus.
So I know that that's a lot to think about. And as I said at the beginning, you would very rarely ever think about all of those different things within one move in class, because it just takes too long, there's not time. But it gives you a little bit of a insight into how you might break down movement and maybe choose just one or two of those things to work with on a particular move. As I said, these, these are tools, so you might then maybe go back, try some of the, get them again, or take these tools away with you and look at some different movement and think about how you can use them to help break down those movements and find your translations. So thank you for watching. I hope that has been useful for you. If you have any questions on translation, please do feel free to put them in the comments box below and we will monitor them and we will get back to you. Also remember to like and subscribe the videos and you can also check out the rest of our videos in our home practice range. Thank you for watching.